The record should show that uh, parties and counsel have returned to the courtroom. The jury is also here. We are ready to hear uh, from the state's next witness. Your Honor, the state calls Michael Allison. You're headed across <clears throat> to the witness chair. Mind the step. Please pause and raise your hand. Oops, excuse me. Right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. There are just a couple of rules when we come into the courtroom. Uh, it's important that you allow the attorneys to finish any question before you start your answer. That's because uh, each word that's being spoken in the courtroom is, is being taken down uh, by Ms. Thomas and the court reporter. So it's important we not interrupt one another. I'm going to ask the attorneys to give you the same courtesy to not ask the next question before you've finished your answer. Okay. All right? Yes, There's also a microphone in front of you. Please make use of that so that we can all hear your testimony. Uh, last but not least, please tell us your full name and spell your first and last names for the record. It's Michael James Allison, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-A-L-L-I-S-O-N. Thank you. You may proceed with your examination, Mr. Maybanks. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. How old of a man are you? I'm 53 years old, sir. Yeah, Mr. Allison um, came to the courtroom today wearing a little bit different clothing than the people that we have been seeing. So, um, or do you have some pending criminal charges? Uh, right now, I'm in Lynn County. Okay. And I have some pending. All right. And we're going to respect your rights and not ask you about those charges because those are still pending, right? Yes, sir. Okay. But I want you to tell us a little bit about uh, yourself uh, in your background. Um, I'm 53 years old. Uh, went to Oklahoma State University and did some student teaching in Omaha, Nebraska and moved, moved to San Diego, California when I went to Iraq for two years in 1990 to 1992. And when I came back from Iraq, I lived in San Diego and had a couple problems with uh, um, marijuana, had two charges. And that's pretty much the history right there. Okay. And so you said you went to Iraq. Were you a member of the Armed Forces? Yes, sir. Okay. What branch? In the Navy. And how long were you in the Navy? Four years. Obviously, uh, from what you're telling us, you are on active duty then? Yes, sir. Okay. And you were um, ordered to serve overseas? Yes, sir. Okay. How many years were you in Iraq? Uh, I was two years. Okay. What, I, Tell, tell us about that. I well, wonder. I actually joined the service just to go to the war, actually. That's why I, I joined. And um, I, went, I went to boot camp in San Diego and went directly to Iraq and then came back for two years in San Diego. And so so you may, get, may we encourage the witness to pull the microphone closer? Yes, sir. Yep. Feel free to speak right into that. Okay. If you would, Michael. <clears throat> um, so you got back from Iraq, and you were living in San Diego circa 1992, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. What did you do with your life then? Uh, I worked um, a couple different jobs. Uh, I was doing the student teaching for a while, but I didn't really feel like that was for me, so I got into some sales. I worked with Sears in um, uh, installations, and I opened a swimming pool business in San Diego. And I actually, I bought a house in 2001 in San Diego. And I got married in 1997. I have two kids. And my ex-wife, um, she's Mexican-American. She just passed away four months ago from a stroke. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Um, did you, when you lived in, so you have two children. How old yes, are your, sir. How old are your kids? Um, my boy, Michael, is 23. He just, he graduated from uh Arizona State University, and he was working in um, Hong Kong, and he came back because of the accident with his with my ex-wife, and I have a daughter who's 17. And where, where, the, where are they? Right now they're in Arizona. Right. So given your circumstances, you haven't had a chance to see him much then? No, not with what has been going on, no. No, sir. Well, Michael, your story doesn't sound uh, much different than some other people, so... Um, can you tell us uh, what happened as far as, um, you mentioned something about marijuana. Did you get, find yourself in some trouble? 
Yeah, I, I had a, uh, when I came back from the war, I ended up having a, a substance abuse problem. And uh, that kind of led to some bad decisions. Um, being in San Diego, uh, it's real common for someone who has a drug problem to drive a, a car across the border or a lot of other little things that you can do to support your habit. And that's kind of what I did. What uh, kind of drugs were you using? I was using cocaine and marijuana. And as a result of that activity and be being uh, becoming involved in drug use, did you pick up a criminal history? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. Do you have some convictions for um, is it importation of marijuana? Yeah, I have two convictions for uh, importation of marijuana. One is approximately 25 years ago, and another one is probably 16 years ago, um, both same circumstances. What, what did you do? I was given the keys to a car in Tijuana, Mexico, and told to drive it across the border okay. um, yeah. for $2,000. They had drugs in it? Yeah. Did you serve some uh, time in prison for that? Yes, sir, I did. <clears throat> Were those convictions um, for importation of marijuana then? Do you remember the date, the year? One was, I think, I think it was approximately 96, and another one was 2005, right in that area. And in between those convictions is when you bought the house and had the family and stuff like that? Yeah, I was working. I was trying to keep things under control, and I was kind of upside, you know, up and down deal. Okay. Um, it's our understanding, too, that um, you recently spent some time in, a, in another prison? Yes, sir. Okay, can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, I was in a Mexican prison for eight years, and uh, that's when I was, I was brought over here in March after serving eight years in a Mexican prison um, for, I was apprehended with a small amount of drugs and a false identification, Tijuana. And they gave me eight years, and I served all eight years of it there in Mexico. Mexico, And when they brought me across the border in March, that's why I'm here today in Lynn, Lynn County, because the charge that I'm facing now is from 2009. And so is that why you, you say Lynn County? Does that mean you're in the Lynn, Lynn County Jail? That's where you're being yeah. held? Yes, sir. Okay. And you said that charge is from 2009, and I don't want you to say anything else about it because we want to respect your rights. But... That was the year year of the accusation. Yes, sir. Okay. Do you remember, Mr. Allison, when you uh, approximately when you first arrived at the Lynn County Correctional Center? Yes, I do. It was um, September twentieth of two thousand nineteen. Do you know the defendant in this case, Jerry uh, Lynn Burns? Yes, I do. And how do you know him? I know him from living in the same unit with him. Did you get to know uh, Mr. Burns from being um, in the Lynn County Jail with him? Yes, I did. Jerry and I probably spoke to each other more than we spoke to anybody else in the unit. When do you think you began speaking with Mr. Burns? Probably about two weeks after I got there. We're both kind of quiet as far as that goes, and we ended up becoming close after that. So after those first couple weeks, did um, what happened? that the two of you began talking, did, did Mr. Burns say something to you or approach you? Or? Yeah, he told me, he came up to me and told me that I was probably one of the most normal people he, see, he has seen come through there. And uh, we just started talking after that. Under what circumstances did you and the defendant uh, speak to each other? How, how did you sp spend your time? Uh, we spent a lot of time playing a game called Pinochle. It's a one-on-one -on -one game or two-on-two, -two, but we played one-on-one. -on -one. It was kind of a quiet time. We could actually talk. While the two of you played Pinochle together, would you talk about each other's uh, lives and you know, matters like that? Yes, we would. Yes, sir. Now, it's our understanding um, that people who are being housed in the Lynn County Jail pending trial, they um, have paperwork with them from their legal proceedings. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, some people do. Okay. 
In, in federal court, is that a thing? In federal court, we don't have any paperwork, but um, there's some paperwork up there. Yeah. In, did the, some of the state court inmates have some paperwork with them? Yeah, I don't think they have the same rules that the, the federal abides by, but I think that they're allowed to have it. At any point in time uh, during your uh, stay with uh, Mr. Burns, did you uh, look at his legal paperwork and police reports or documents or anything like that? No, never. Okay. Never. Now, um, getting back for a moment, Mr. Allison, about your life and some of the things we talked about here today and your criminal history, uh, an interesting one that led you to being in uh, Mexican prison. It's fair to say you have some regrets about some of the choices you've made? Absolutely. A lot of them. Is that something that you ever spoke to the defendant about, about having regrets? Yeah. I spoke to him quite a bit about uh, being regretful for getting into the problems I had with, with substance abuse problems and and uh, feeling like that led me to most of my problems. Um, and when you talked to the defendant about substance abuse and his problems, did what, if anything, did the defendant say to you <coughs> in response to you talking about your regrets? Uh, he said he couldn't really understand about uh, being a drug addict, because he never was, but he wished he had uh, listened to his dad and cleaned up after himself, which I thought was kind of strange. I didn't really understand what he was saying at the time. I'll object to the characterization of strange around his uh, improper subject of opinion testimony and ask that my objection precede the witness's answer and move to strike the answer. Any response to the objection, Mr. Maybanks? Uh, yes, Your Honor. I think Mr. Allison is just uh, explaining his impression and response given the context of the conversation and how he construed it as a, a normal person would. Members of the jury, uh, I am instructing you to take that as a, just a personal observation made by this witness. Um, nothing more, nothing less, just his personal observation of a conversation that he claims to have had. You may ask your next question. Thank you, Your Honor. So in regards to this conversation about regrets, Mr. Burns indicated to you that um, he wished he would have cleaned up after himself? Is that yes, sir. With respect to the um, time period of Mr. Burns' offense and on the same comment that he made, did um, Mr. Burns ever indicate anything to you about uh, circumstances of um, the crime back in the day and his thoughts about it? Yeah, that was in the same conversation, actually, and uh, he said at that time, I think it was 79, he said, or in that area that no one was thinking about a, a DNA as far as it being a possibility. Did you ever ask the defendant directly if he committed the crime with, with, he, with, with, with which he's charged? Yes, I did. I asked him directly. If I asked him, Jerry, did you do it? do the crime, and he said, I can't talk about this. Did he ever suggest to you during your conversations with him that he didn't do it? No, never. You mentioned that you and the defendant would frequently play, um, that Mr. Burns that would play Pinochle together. Do you recall uh, a time, and um, this would be approximately within the last month or since the beginning of the year or so, when you were playing uh, pinochle with Mr. Burns and you kept beating him? Yeah, um, I remember that well because um, he had told me if I keep beating him in pinochle, he was going to have to take me to the mall. Mr. Allison, have you heard um, Mr. Burns make that comment to other people? or in your presence? No, sir. And do you recall uh, an incident within the last month or so when uh, Mr. Burns came back uh, from court and told you about an encounter uh, that he had with investigator Denley, or with a police officer in the hallway? Yeah, he, he said it was a 
when he was leaving the courtroom, and I think it was his last court day, he said that, um, I can't remember if it, was a, if it was a detective or if it was a police officer, he said that they had somewhat of a stare down, and he told me that sometimes he called me son, and he said, son, he said, they might have me, but I don't have to bow my head to them. And they kind of stared at each other. While you were um, staying with uh, Mr. Burns, while you guys were in the same um, cell block, um, did his case ever come up uh, in the newspaper? Yeah, it was in the news newspaper. Yeah, I want to take you specifically to um, a Saturday in January, January the 11th of this year, 2020, in the morning. Uh, do you recall an incident where the defendant's picture had appeared in the newspaper and you had an interaction with him about it? Yes, I do. Um, did you have uh, that newspaper in your uh, possession when that interaction took place? Yeah, it was on the table with us. And did you have a conversation with him about his picture being in the newspaper? Yes, I did. And um, Mr. Allison, did you... Um, make a request to it, in just or not for Mr. Burns to autograph or sign that newspaper for you? Yes, I did. You just mentioned a little bit ago that um, at times Mr. Burns would call you son? Yes, sir. Uh, how did that happen? Is, it, is that just something uh, he just started to refer to you as? Yeah, yeah I was kind of just, we just kind of had that interaction going. Sometimes I'd even call him dad, but uh, we just kind of did that sometimes. Okay. May I approach witness, Sean? You may. The handy witness what's been previously marked as State's Exhibit 16C1. <coughs> Mr. Allison, I ask you if you recognize this photograph in this picture. <coughs> yes, sir, I do. <coughs> and is this uh, the same photograph that you saw in the newspaper that you were reading or had in your possession that you handed to Mr. Burns to sign or autograph? Yes, it is. <clears throat> and does this contain the writing um, on that picture that um, Mr. Burns uh, wrote on and well, left it for you? or? Y yes, it is. Yes, it is. Is this a fair and accurate uh, copy of the picture and the, the writing and the signature from uh, Mr. Burns as you observed him? Do. Yes, sir. It is. Move to admit state 16C1, Your Honor. Mr. Spees, have you had an opportunity to inspect what's been proposed as 16C1? I have, Your Honor. Uh, subject only to the uh, uh, motion made prior to trial, I have uh, no objection. Okay. Uh, the court will receive uh, states 16C1 and make it part of the record. Permission to publish, Your Honor? You may. Uh, Mr. Allison, the photograph's going to come up right above you on that TV there. Um, Mr. Allison, this is the uh, exhibit that's just been received as 16C1. Is this the uh, photograph that appeared in the morning newspaper um, in Cedar Rapids with um, Mr. Burns depicted in it? Yes, it is, sir. And is this... Uh, the note that he wrote to you and his signature that he signed in your presence? Yes, it is. And what does that say? It says, to my favorite son, Michael, Jerry Burns. Thank you. I'll go ahead and take that down. Um, you recall in the unit um, situation or time when Mr. Burns acted out in a surprising fashion to, to you? Yeah, um, there was a couple instances. Excuse me, uh, I think it called for a yes or no answer, and I asked the oh. witness to restrict his answer to that. All right, yes, I do. Okay. And do you recall, um, and what, what situation do you recall where uh, Mr. Burns acted out in a, in a manner that surprised you um, uh, in the cell um, in a, or alarmed you? Your Honor, I object to this as irrelevant and any relevance is exceeded by its uh, undue uh, likelihood of injecting prejudice into this trial under Rule 5403, I object. Uh, 
Council approach, please. The objection uh, is overruled, and Mr. Allison may answer the question. There was an incident in there where uh, more than one time where the person that sleeps above Jerry, uh, he snores a little bit, and uh, he caught us all off guard where he grabbed the bunk and almost pulled the bunk halfway down. He almost <laughs> fell out of the bed, and we were all just kind of in shock at the outburst. Uh, Mr. Allison... Has uh, Mr. Burns discussed with you uh, his feelings regarding the um, potential outcome of his trial, or something he told you told to you about? No matter what happens, what his feelings would be? Yeah, he feels like uh, no matter what happens in this case, that he he wins because he had the, had the opportunity to be out there with his family all these years. No further questions at this time, Your Honor. Cross-examination, Mr. Spees. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Allison, uh, you've obviously alluded to the fact that you had access to newspapers in the uh, unit in which you and Mr. Burns were housed, right? Yes, sir. Would you get them on a daily basis? Yes, sir. So the uh, news coverage surrounding Mr. Burns's prosecution you were able to read as soon as you got into the unit in September of last year? Yes, sir. And you read it? Of course. Uh, did you consider Mr. Burns something of a father figure? Um, I thought he was pretty, uh, pretty calm guy when I when I met him. I mean, when we first met. Sure. So, um, Mr. Allison, you've described uh, for the uh, men and women of the jury and for us uh, something of your criminal background, and you talked about the difficulties that you had. Um, I take it after you got back from the service? Yes, sir. And you uh, said that you also got into sales? Yes, sir. You got into sales in a big way, didn't you? Um, and by that, I mean you got into selling drugs. I, well, I drove drugs across the, the border. That's what happened. Yes, sir. You were trafficking in drugs? I importation of marijuana, yes, sir. Right. That's trafficking, isn't it? Uh, I don't know. It's called importation. In addition to that, uh, you were also convicted in 1996 of conspiracy to com commit mail fraud. Yes, sir. And you went to federal prison for that? Uh, for telemarketing. And in addition to uh, going to federal prison, you were also placed on supervised release? Yes, sir. And we'll talk about that more in just a bit. In um, 1997, you were convicted of importing marijuana? Yes, sir. And you went to federal prison for that? Yes, sir. In 2003, you were convicted of bringing illegal aliens in to the United States? Yes, sir. And you went to federal prison for that? Yes, sir. In 2005, you were again convicted of importing marijuana and went to federal prison for that? Yes, sir. In uh, 2007, you were convicted of again bringing in, in illegal aliens from across the border? Yes, sir. And went to federal prison for that? Yes, sir. You're currently in, indicted in the United States District Court for the Northern District of Iowa in Cedar Rapids with another conspiracy to distribute drugs, aren't you? Um, yes, sir. And this time you're charged with conspiracy to uh, distribute methamphetamine? Yes, sir. And that's what you're in the Lynn County Jail for now? Yes, sir. And, and the charge against you in that indictment arose from 2009 and 2010? Yes, sir. And <clears throat> um, if I may approach, Your Honor. You may. Okay. Showing you uh, Defendant's Exhibit G1, Mr. Allison, is this the indictment that's pending against you in federal court in Cedar Rapids? Yes, sir, it is. And uh, in uh, count one of that indictment, you're charged with 
conspiracy to distribute marijuana, I'm sorry, conspiracy to distribute methamphetamine, having previously been convicted of two drug trafficking offenses. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, so did G1 accurately describe the, the charges that you're facing in Cedar Rapids now? Yes, sir. Okay. We offer a G1, Your Honor. Any objection to G1? No, Your Honor. G1 will be received and made part of the record. And the uh, charge that you're facing in federal court right, right now, <coughs> the uh, conviction for that, if you're convicted, you stand to face a mandatory minimum of 15 years in prison? Yes, sir. And, and a maximum of life in prison? Yes, sir. But that maximum and, and minimum don't tell the, tell the whole story, do they? Mm, I can get 15, 15 is the minimum and 25 is the max. Life is the maximum, isn't it? No, it's 25 years, sir. Okay, so um, based on your prior experience in federal court, you know that the sentence that you receive if you're convicted of that is going to be based on the federal sentencing guidelines. Yes, sir. And the federal sentencing guidelines are a, uh, a system by which judges determine factors that might apply in, in determining a sentencing range for you. Mm -hmm. right? Yes, sir. And to be clear, in the, in the federal system, there is no parole, is there? It's supervised release. There is no parole in the federal system. Oh, no. No, sir. So if you get sentenced to prison, you serve that time minus a 13% or so for good time behavior. Yeah, 15%. And in addition to serving a prison sentence, after you get out of prison, you're placed on supervised release. Yes, sir. And supervised release is a form of, of supervision by a federal probation officer. Yes, it is. If you violate supervised release, you go back to prison. Yes, sir. And you violated supervised release before, haven't you? Yes, sir. You violated your supervised release in 1997, 1999, 2005, <laughs> 2008 and 2019, didn't you? Yes, sir. And you went back to prison? Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about these sentencing guidelines, okay? Under the uh, federal system, if you commit a federal crime, there is a cookbook, the federal sentencing guidelines that establishes a base offense level, and then there are additions or subtractions to that base offense level, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, sir. You're, you're very familiar with this, aren't you? Yes, sir. And in addition, there is a calculation about what your criminal history category is, right? Yes, sir. And the criminal ha history category is a system of points to determine where on a scale you fall on the criminal history score, right? Yes, sir. Would looking at a, a copy of the sentencing table help the jury understand what you've just been talking about? Uh, I imagine so, sir. Okay. If I may approach, Your Honor. You may. For demonstrative purposes, we'd like to show the uh, sentencing table. And if we could uh, show this on the screen, please. So what you have there in front of you, um, Mr. Allison, is the federal sentencing table. This is a, a chart that's used by the federal courts to determine a sentencing range, right? Yes, sir. So across the uh, vertical axis where it says offense level. Yes, sir. That's where uh, a base offense level is determined, and then there are additions and subtractions to that base offense level based on all sorts of factors. Yes, sir. And across the horizontal axis is the criminal history category. And that's based on the number of offenses you've committed, uh, when you committed them, whether you want probation or parole at the time, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And in your current federal case, you've negotiated a plea agreement with the United States Attorney, haven't you? Yes, sir. And uh, that plea agreement is a contract between you and the United States Attorney about how your case might turn out. Yes. If you plead guilty. Right. Yes, sir. And um, in that uh, plea agreement, not only does uh, did you agree to plead guilty to count one of that indictment, but you agreed that there might be a, a decision about how your sentence would be calculated? Yes, sir. I'm going to show you a Mr. Allison Defendant's Exhibit H1 and ask you if you'll take a look at H1 for me. Tell 
tell the men and women what H1 is? H1? <coughs> what this exhibit is. Oh, this is a plea agreement. Okay. Yeah. It's a plea agreement between you and the United States Attorney. Yes, it is. And you signed it, your lawyer signed it, the United States Attorney prosecuting you signed it as well. Yes, sir. All right. So in that plea agreement, there is a, a section called stipulation of facts, right? Okay. Yes, sir. And the stipulation of facts are the facts that you agreed are true and that you agreed that the court could take into account and could decide in your sentence. Yes, sir. And in that stipulation of facts, you agreed that, um, by the way, this agreement calls for you to plead guilty to count one of the indictment. Yes, sir. And you admitted that in 1997, as you told us just a moment ago, you were convicted of importing marijuana. Yes, sir. And in 2005, you were convicted of importing marijuana. Yes, sir. And then uh, you admit that in 2009 and 2010, you conspired to distribute at least 500 grams of methamphetamine. Yes, sir. And in the summer of 2007, in California, you conspired with someone to um, agree to a scheme to import methamphetamine. On, well, on this plea agreement, sir? Yes. Um, this actual plea agreement is not actually active right now. It's not accurate? No. Even though you signed it? No, it's, this, this has been taken off the board. I'm, I'm no longer, I haven't pled guilty to this case. Yeah, and we're going to get into that, but okay. in signing that agreement, you agreed to those facts, didn't you? No, but I actually went back in front of the judge, and, and the deal has been taken off the table. Sir, each one of those paragraphs you initialed as being true, didn't you? Yes, sir. But just afterwards... Um, they called me back into court, and we took it off the table because we're, we're going to renegotiate a different deal. Um, I, I pled guilty in front of a magistrate judge, and the district judge uh, decided that it would be best if we renegotiate a different deal. So I have not pled guilty to this case yet, no, sir. Um, you know, I think I understand that, Mr. Allison, but tell me this. When you signed that agreement and initialed each one of the paragraphs in, in uh, Defendant's Exhibit H1, you agreed that each of those facts was were true, didn't um, you? Actually, sir, if you can turn it to um, okay, yeah, to um, paragraph on the sentencing provisions, where it says pursuant pursuant to Rule 11C1C of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, the court shall be bound by the terms of this plea agreement, including the sentencing range as determined under the sentencing guidelines. If the court does not agree to be bound, neither party shall be bound by or held to perform the obligations imposed of this agree agreement. The agreement shall be rendered null and void. Sir, I understand that, and, and we're going to talk about that more, but when you initial each one of those paragraphs in Defendant's Exhibit H1 and signed it, at the time you signed it, you agreed each one of those facts was true, didn't you? Well, at the time, sir, but at this point, um, I really can't talk about the plea agreement because I haven't pled guilty to the case. Sir, that's not my question. My question is, by initialing those paragraphs and signing it, you agreed that those facts were true. Initially, I did. We offer H1 if it hasn't been admitted yet, Your Honor. Any objection to H1? Uh, yes, Your Honor. We object on the grounds that um, this would be in violation of Iowa Rule of Evidence 403. Uh, the probative value is outweighed by the da danger of unfair prejudice in that this is not a current valid plea agreement. Uh, there's a prejudice um, uh, for the jury to consider this not only for the contents that are not active in uh, any kind of plea agreement, but also um, would uh, if received into evidence would be uh, compromised Mr. Allison's constitutional rights, uh, being that these charges are still pending. Um, and given the testimony of Mr. Allison not ag uh, agreeing that the facts that he initialed in there are valid, only that uh, they were part of a plea agreement at the time, um, it would lead to a confusion of the issues as well. Mr. Spees, any response? Yes, Your Honor. This, this agreement goes to the bias of the witness. Whether the facts are true or not, it's, it's representations that he made to the court, and it shows his bias, and it also shows his credibility. The uh, objection will be overruled. The court will receive uh, Defendant's Exhibit H1 and make it part of the record. Um, 
given the nature of the exhibit, I, I believe it has been, uh, I have received it at this point under seal, so I'll give special direction to the jury should they, should they wish to view this, um, that, that it is under seal from not only this court, but the United States uh, District Court. So, well, we wouldn't expect you to publish any of the, the exhibits that you see, but it, you'll need to take special care um, with, with H1. So you'll receive further instruction, but the uh, exhibit will be received uh, and made part of the record. Thank you. Now, uh, Mr. Allison, uh, if, again, if I may approach. You may. In uh, consideration of the <coughs> agreement that you attempted to negotiate with the United States Attorney and later had the opportunity to withdraw, which we'll talk about, you had in mind these sentencing guidelines, didn't you? Oh, well, yeah, everyone on a federal case right. goes by the federal guidelines. And in the uh, plea agreement that you reached, there were some preliminary calculations about how your guidelines might work, weren't there? Yes, sir. And uh, in federal drug cases, the offense level is driven by the weight of the drugs that a person like you was involved with. Yes, sir. And based on the plea agreement, exhibit H1, there was a preliminary determinant based on the amount of methamphetamine you were conspiring to traffic your base offense level was 34. Yes, sir. And uh, based on the fact that you had imported methamphetamine from another country, there was an additional level added to that, right? Objection. I think that's asking the witness to admit some kind of guilt when a case is pending. If you could uh, rephrase the question, Mr. Spees, it's not clear whether you were talking about previous conduct by the witness or if it was the current conduct that he's charged with. Sure. I'm referring to Exhibit H1, the plea agreement that we just talked about. Base offense level was cited with 34 and an increase of two levels because you imported methamphetamine from another country. Yes, sir, but what you're not quite getting at understanding is the reason that the deal was pulled was because they, they were going to change it from 15 to life to 0 to 20. So the weight came down, they saw the mistake, and that's why they pulled the deal. All right. But again, in this uh, plea agreement, because you're an habitual offender, a career offender, your base offense level is now at 37. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Well, that's what H1 says, doesn't it? Um, I'm not sure on this particular deal because this deal's not, you know. You take a, a look at paragraph 11C. Right, but see, this, these are the things that have changed in the next deal. That's why this isn't. But in agreeing to it, you understood how those guidelines might affect you, right? At that time, but my at the time, my lawyer, Chris Nathan, had, had caught the mistake, and that's why we pulled it. Okay. Under uh, the agreement that you negotiated, you were looking at a level 37 and an offense level category 6. Well, actually, if you look at that deal, since we're talking about that deal, it's a, it's a rule 1C. Yeah, it's for 210 months, for 17 years. And we're going to get to that. Mm -hmm. So, but otherwise, you were looking at a potential sentence of 360 months to life under this agreement. No, that, that agreement is bound to 210 months. If the judge rejected 210 months, you were looking at 360 to life. Yeah, she didn't re reject the, the deal. Well, she did. Because you attempted to plead guilty before a magistrate judge that's that's what I did, and when we, when I went in front of uh, Judge Reed, she asked me if I wanted to keep the deal, and I told her no. It'd be best not to at that time, because they were going to change the wording on it and change it from 15 to life to zero to 20. So my lawyer advised me to go ahead and pull the deal. Okay, you thought you were going to get a deal of 210 months when you originally negotiated that. Uh, yes, originally I did. Yeah, and you pleaded guilty on December 4. 2019 before Magistrate Judge in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Yes, I did. And then on December 6, Judge Reed rejected it. No, she asked me if I wanted to keep it. And she said that she would prefer not to have it because she doesn't like to ha be bound by the courts. But she left it up to me, and I decided to pull it under my lawyer's advice. So uh, she rescheduled another hearing for you on January 15th, and you appeared and got new counsel on January 15th. Yes. So um, the, Judge Reed had rejected that plea agreement because she doesn't approve those kinds of plea agreements. 
she explained to me that she doesn't like those type of plea agreements, and she told me that I could go ahead and keep it, but she preferred that I not, not keep that deal. Well, Mr. Allison, she told you she would not be bound by that plea agreement, right, didn't she? Right, she did. And she told you that she could give you a much more severe sentence than 210 months? No, she did not tell me that at all. You knew that, though, didn't you? Under my, my lawyer's advice, he told me it would be best to pull the deal. That's why I would entered that deal. It's a 11C1C for 210 months, and if not, we pull the deal and renegotiate. And that's when they decided to go from 15 to life to zero to 20. Do you have a new deal now? Um, I'm waiting for it. That's why, that's why we pulled that deal. Okay. So knowing uh, that you didn't have a deal on uh, January 15th when you got new counsel, um, you then informed your lawyer that you had information about Mr. Burns and wanted to speak to the prosecutors. No, I had nothing to do with it at all. Well, you informed your lawyer that you had information about Mr. Burns, didn't you? Well, of course. That's who I had to talk to to, to uh, um, talk to the prosecutor. Yes, sir. These prosecuting attorneys? No. The United States attorney? Yes, sir. You had a meeting with the United States attorney? No, but... sir. Well, who did you talk to? I talked to my lawyer, Chad Reese, Freezy, I mean. And then he talked to who? Um, to an investigator and to the prosecutor. Here? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Uh, Allison, can you tell the men and women of the jury what Section 5K1 of the Sentencing Guidelines provides? It's, I'm not sure of the wording on it. Um, you could probably read it to me. Yeah, 5K1 allows the government to ask for a lesser sentence for you than those guidelines call for it. Isn't that right? On a federal case, see, yes. Yeah, if you cooperate with the prosecution or investigation of somebody else. Yes, sir. And can you tell the men and women of the jury what Section 3553E of the Federal Criminal Code provides? No, sir. Does that allow the prosecutor to ask a judge to sentence you, sentence you below a mandatory minimum if you cooperate? Okay, yes, sir. You know that, don't you? No, sir. Well, in the plea agreement that you've uh, entered into earlier that you've now rejected, it provides that the government was not going to make a motion for your cooperation. Isn't that true? No, I didn't have a cooperating deal. Yeah, and that's what I said. You had no cooperation agreement. No, I still don't, sir. And uh, they weren't going to make a, a motion for a reduction unless you cooperated and had a cooperation agreement. I don't know, sir. I've never talked to them about cooperation. Okay. But you're cooperating here, aren't you? Um, I'm, co I'm cooperating right now. But, I mean, at that time, I had no cooperation deal, and I had talked to nobody about a cooperation deal. So you met with uh, Mr. Baybanks and Investigator Denlinger on January 28th to tell them what you believed you knew about Jerry Birds and what you'd heard. Yeah, I had, I had one meeting. Yeah. We talked a little bit, and you, you mentioned uh, in conversation with Mr. Maybanks about discovery. And in federal court, they don't let you keep your discovery in the jail, do they? No, sir. But in state court, you can. I imagine so, sir. And you know that Mr. Burns had his discovery there in the jail? I didn't know for sure, no. In the unit that you and Mr. Burns were in, though, you bunked right next to one another, didn't you? Yes, sir. Again, if I may approach, Your Honor. You may. Q and R. show you what's been identified as a defendant's exhibit Q1. Can you tell us what that is, please? Q1. Uh, this is where we live. This is where Jerry lives, and this is where I lived. Okay. Um, and is this a, an accurate depiction, a screenshot of the video showing the unit in which you and Mr. Burns were located? Yes, it is. Are you in that picture? Yes, sir. Where are you? I'm right here, sir. All right. If we could have that up on the screen, please, if we could publish it, Your Honor. We offer a Q1 into evidence. Any objection to Q1? No, Your Honor. Q1 will be received and made part of the record. Um, Mr. Robinson, uh, using the pointer here, could you uh, show, first of all, where you're located? Yes, I'm right here. And uh, can you show us, uh, please, where your bunk and Mr. Burns' bunk are? Yes, Jerry Burns slept right here, and I slept right here. 
Is that Mr. Burns in the, between the bunks? Yeah, it does, yeah, that is Jerry. Showing you now exhibit R1. Can you tell us what R1 is? It's, it's the same unit. Okay, and does this accurately portray the, uh, the layout of the unit, again, showing the beds that you and Mr. Burns occupied? Yes, sir. Okay. We offer exhibit R1. Any objection to R1? No objection. R1 will be received and made part of the record. If we could publish that as well, Your Honor. You may. Again, uh, looking at uh, R1 uh, there, Mr. Allison, could you again point out the, the bunks where Mr. Burns and you occupied? Yeah, this is Jerry's bunk and this is my bunk. And is that Mr. Burns uh, there uh, bent over between the bunks? Yes, it is. And is that uh, where he kept his legal papers back against the wall between the bunks? Uh, I imagine he kept it in his box there, but he kept his commissary there. So, um, Mr. Allison, when Mr. Burns had visitors, for example, he visited with his family or visited with his pastor or visited with me, you had access to that discovery material, didn't you? Mm, no, sir. <laughs> As you can see, that unit is so small that uh, in that setting, nobody touches anything of anybody else's, sir. Mm. Nothing. And uh, were you on the bottom bunk? Yes, sir. And was Mr. Burns on the bottom bunk? Yes, sir. And that box is right between you? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Allison, are you currently suffering from any emotional or a mental illness? No, sir. Have you ever been diagnosed with a mental illness? Uh, no, sir. Have you ever undergone treatment in a federal prison for a mental illness? No, sir. Or been placed in a special housing unit? while serving a sentence for smuggling illegal aliens. A special housing unit? Yes. No, sir. On supervised release, uh, did a federal probation officer or the court order you to obtain a mental health assessment? Uh, yeah, that's pretty normal in federal supervised release. And to follow up with any recommended treatment? Yeah, follow up with any kind of medications or anything people are taking, yeah. Okay. Did you tell a federal probation officer Mr. Allison, that you'd never been diagnosed with a mental health disorder in that, the past? That I never have been? Yeah. I've been diagnosed with some depression issues, but as far as mental health, no. Did you also tell the federal probation officer that you use this diagnosis as a bargaining chip? No, sir. If I may approach, Your Honor. You may. You may. <coughs> Mr. Allison, in the United States District Court, the Southern District of California, in uh, case number 07-2681, you, you uh, told the men and women of the jury just a short while ago that your supervision had been revoked for non-compliance or violating your terms of supervised release. Yes, sir. Right. And in meeting with your probation officer, preparing a violation summary, did you tell your probation officer that you had been placed in a special housing unit to closely monitor your mental health and that you told your probation officer during the initial supervision interview on August 26, 2008, that you reported to that officer that you had never been diagnosed with any mental health disorder and that in the past you had used this alleged disorder as a, quote, bargaining chip? Objection. Can we approach, Your Honor? You may. Pending, would you please read that back? <coughs> Question and meeting with your probation officer and preparing a violation summary. Did you tell your probation officer that you had been placed in a special housing unit to closely monitor your mental health and that you had told your probation officer during the initial supervision supervision interview on August 26, 2008, that you reported to that officer that you had never been diagnosed with me any mental health disorder and that in the past you had used this alleged disorder as a, quote, bargaining chip. Uh, 
the, that's what I said. Yes, yes. Um, thank you, Brad. That's what I said. Yes, sir. But no, I mean, in this, in this, I didn't um, understand the question actually. Are you talking about this, this here, or what I said? I'm asking what, what you told your probation. Officer. Oh no, my probation officer. Uh, as far as that report that I just read there, uh, as far as being in a special housing yeah. unit, I I know that report now that I see it, and it's it's not accurate as far as how it reads. I was placed in a special housing unit because I take um, seizure medication. And as far as using my uh, mental health for a bargaining chip, that was not said. But I, I've been in a special housing unit for my seizure medication I take daily. So what your probation officer put in uh, quotes? Yeah, we, we actually had an objection with that comment. Um, but as far as a special housing unit, I have been in because of the seizure medication I take. Well, Mr. Allison, your uh, supervised release was revoked because of these allegations. Well, no, no, sir. That my supervised release was revoked because um, of the time I spent in Mexican prison. <coughs> That's why it was from 2009. So, Mr. Allison, are you using uh, Jerry Burns as a bargaining chip to try to get a better sentence in your federal case? No, sir, not at all. No other questions. Thank you. Redirect, Mr. Maybanks. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Allison, as you sit here. Uh, today in front of us in this jury, have you received any kind of promise of a plea agreement or a deal to testify? None at all, sir. When was it while you were living with Mr. Burns in the Lynn County Jail, did you decide that you were gonna tell your lawyer about what Mr. Burns had been talking about? I decided to approach my attorney after Mr. Burns made the comment about um, he was going to have to take me to the mall if I kept winning a pinochle. That's when I just, that was it for Why? me. Why was that the final straw? Um, it disgusted me. You have a daughter? Yes, I do. How old is she? She's 17. Nothing further, Your Honor. Additional cross-examination, Mr. Spies. Not necessary, thank you. Okay. Thank you, you may step down. Okay. Counsel, if you'd please approach. Ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, reached the conclusion of our witnesses for today. We will adjourn early. Uh, I remind you once again of the admonition. Uh